today what we will do is uh, we'll uh, talk about bearings. So, but before I do that, uh, last class uh, I showed you. Let me just share the screen, and I'll take a few minutes to just explain uh, one of the tables which I showed last in the last class, uh, but it was not very clear. So, just let me give me a minute. I'll do that, and then we can uh, get back to our stuff. So let me just show this uh, book chapter here. Yeah. So I had showed you the uh, the length of the bolts, right? So and I and I told you that there is something called Renard series. So if I have a Renard series, it basically means that uh, I have to divide, uh, say, uh, say a length into some some sizes, right? So use something called Renard series. And the Renard series can be done to divide it in, in, in five sections. Sometimes you can do it in, uh, in, um, in a group of five, in a group of 10, 20, 40. So basically say, let's take an example that I have a, a one inch diameter, uh, one inch diameter uh, bolt, and I have to have uh, say five, uh, uh, say I have to have five, uh, what do, what do I call it? Um, five uh, different sizes for this one inch bolt between say one inch and 10 inch. Let's assume that my size of the length can go between one inch to 10 inch. These are the sizes which you should manufacture one inch, 1.6 inch, 2.5 inch, 4 inch, 6.3 and 10 inch. So this is what Renard series says that if you have to have different lengths, you use this kind of a uh, this kind of uh, so you basically map one is to ten. So if I assume that I have uh, the sizes between one to ten, these will be these will be the sizes which you will get. The length the length will be one one point six two point five. If I say if I want to do uh, ten divisions, ten different heights within one inch and ten inch, then I will go one one point two five one point six two point three two point five four. 3.15, 6 uh, 6.3, 6.3, 8 and 10. Right. Similarly, if I if I want 20 divisions, 20 different lengths between one inch and one inch and 10 inch, then I go ahead and include the R5, R10 and R20 additions. If I want 40 different sizes between the two, then I would use uh, uh, R5, R10, R20 and R40. So I'll have 40 different sizes. So the standard of bolt length will be based on this Renard, uh, Renard series. It's called Renard series. So last time I was not able to explain properly. So I just wanted to share how Renard series work. And this is what they do it for any. So any if you have to have a nail, right? Uh, you are you are basically a nail manufacturer and you have to uh, you have to uh, manufacture nails of different sizes. So how do you choose those sizes? Say I have to choose, say, from 100 mm, uh, say uh, 20 mm to 100 mm, and you need to have five different sizes there. So what you will do is 20 mm would be one, and uh, and 100 mm will be 10, and then you use the same same uh, fractions to size different lengths. So that's how you use this Renard series for sizing the bolt length, for creating a standard for bolt length. So all the sizes will not be available; they will be available based on these. Renard's series. So that's what I wanted to share. I probably did not do a, I did not uh, uh, make you understand this very clearly. How, what kind of bolt lengths are available? So this is this is the basic table, which is based on Renard uh, series. Any questions on this one? So any nail manufacturer, any bolt manufacturer, screw manufacturer, the screw lens, the nail lens. That's how they decide. They use this kind of a Renard series to decide what lens they should manufacture. Any questions on this uh, this thing? Uh, hopefully this is clear to you. Before we move on to the bearings. Any questions about this? About how do you decide what bolt, uh, bolt lengths to manufacture? Diameter we know, right? Once we have diameter, we know the bolt head size, the bolt width size, all that is there as per specification. But length is something that we that uh, has to be decided and length is decided based on these Renard series. OK. Any questions up till now? No. So what I will do is we'll move on to the bearings. OK. 
So what I want to show you is, uh, let me just first uh, unshare this. And then what I will do is I will uh, show you. So let me see. I don't know if I can uh, put my, uh, if you guys can see uh, my video in the screen. So they, everybody knows what a bearing is, right? How many people don't know what a bearing is? Can you see? Can you see the? Uh, can you see this? What I am showing it in the cam in the camera? I would like to basically. I would like you to basically have full screen. I don't know how to. Do so are you guys able to see this in full screen? Yeah. So, so the, try to see this in full screen. Uh, this is what uh, is a bearing, right? Everybody knows bearing, right? Who doesn't know what bearing does? Try to see how do you, how do I, I don't know if I can make this uh, full screen. I have no idea how to do that. Pin video, okay, let me see if I can pin video. Sir, individually we have to pin a, pin your video. I thought the person who speaks automatically gets panned on. Apparently, I thought. So you can select the spotlight option. Okay. That's what Webex does. Let me see if I can. Okay, so you can you can pin it, right? You can set the spotlight by checking three dots. I tried. Okay, let me see. Spotlight, right? Spotlight, spotlight. Nope, I don't see spotlights in mine. Let me see. Uh, yeah, sir, we can do it ourselves, sir. Everyone can click. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they can pin my video. So that, that is fine. Yes. It, for a brief time, you can do it. You actually just pin my videos. I think that would be OK for you to do. Uh, so this is this is what it is, right? Uh, OK. So my question is, if you see this bearing, right? Uh, what does a bearing do? How many people know what a bearing does? What does this bearing do? You can either unmute yourself or you can chat in the chat box. What, 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 what does this mean? What does this bearing do? And why do we need a bearing? This is an example of a bearing. This is actually a, a helical, helical gear right here. And this is a shaft and there is a bearing right here. What is bearing used for? facilitates relative motion. OK, is that all? Allows frictionless rotation. These are very good answers. Uh, frictionless rotation is uh, there. Uh, there. So basically, I, I can allow the shaft to rotate, but bearing. Uh, you can also have stationary bearings where there is no rotation. What does word bearing mean? The word bearing itself, B E A R I N G bearing. What does bear mean? Bear loads, yes. So bearing means something supporting, right? Of course, it allows motion, but there can be there can be different types of bearing. So I don't know if you guys can see this bearing. This bearing is the same bearing here. Let me just go ahead and show you this bearing. Okay. Okay. What is this bearing? How many people know what this bearing is? What kind of bearing is this? What what is there in here? In this, what is there? So it's a it's a it's a ball bearing, right? That's fine. That's a the good answer is a ball bearing, right? What is this one? If you can see this, let me just show you like this. This will be more clear. This is also a bearing. Is it a ball bearing? Cylindrical bearing. Uh, it's actually called roller bearing, but yeah, it, it's, it actually has a whole bunch of cylinders. Okay. So this is this is a ball bearing. This is a this is a Roller bearing, right? There are other kind of things. So in a in any bearing, right? I don't know if you can see this. 
so this is these are the balls and the balls are actually contained in a cage you have to hold those balls in a cage so this is a cage there are balls and then there would be supporting things thrust i can i can bearings are supposed to take in some cases they are supposed to take radial loads so how how do you transfer this load so if i if i have this thing right here right how do i transfer the load how is the load transferred how is the load transferred because i have to i have a bearing right this bearing has to finally bearing will bear some load right and of course it will also allow relative motion and rotation those two aspects it does it actually bears the load so it will transfer the load somewhere it will take this load and transfer it to somewhere and it will allows you it allows you rotation frictionless motion relative motion whatever you guys have answered is correct but primary activity of this is taking load a and b be able to rotate so there are two two concepts which will be there load and rotation you have to remember that okay load and rotation these will be the two things which you have to worry about rotations and load now how the how, how is this bearing mounted on a on a physical device any ideas how do i mount it what would i do any answers Then press fit is fine. It can be press fit, shrink fit, not this. This you are right that it can be press fit, interference fit. It can be different kind of fits. That's fine. But how is this this bearing? How will it transfer the load? How what will you do with the bearing? How do you support the bearing? Not fit the bearing. How do you support this bearing? This bearing is there, right? The shaft is there. What do I do next? okay it's called bearing housing kind of casing so i will make a housing for this and support it with some 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 support in the ground or wherever on the machine structure so this bearing will have a housing or casing is the right word but it's primarily housing bearing housing it is called so bearing housing and with this housing this housing will be supported on either a structure or somewhere on the machine equipment so that you have to have you will transfer this finally to a structure this bearing will go to housing and housing will go to some structural support right so that's how you do it so bearing bearing housing and structural support so these things i wanted to just give you first and then we'll go ahead and start sharing today's uh, today's class okay, let me just share this one second let me share this and then we'll take from there okay okay so the key aspect of bearing would be multiple things what kind of bearings are there we'll discuss what kind of bearings are there that's the first thing which we'll discuss and then we'll discuss about bearing life what is the life and load basically two things life and load ratings these will be the things which we will talk about life bearing life and load rating because if i'm buying something right i need to know how reliable it is what kind of life it will have so the bearing uh, manufacturers right they have these uh, data which they have created so bearing basically one of the things to know about bearing would be today i'll give you some of the some of the key things to to know about bearings uh, load ratings bearing life and reliability so load 
so I'll talk about load. Load. Sorry. My mistake. I should at least spell load right. Load. Life. Reliability. Reliability. And I will show you some examples how to how to select bearings. <clears throat> and then finally, in the next class on Monday, I will actually use SKF uh, uh, brochure, basically SKF uh, catalog. How to choose a bearing for a, for any if you want to select a bearing, how do you go about selecting it using a catalog? So that also we will actually talk about a little bit. The bearing features. So you have to select a bearing for your application. So how do we do that? I'll walk you through that as well. So these are the things which we will do in in uh, rolling element bearings. All these roller bearings, roller bearings and ball bearings and ball bearings are termed as rolling element bearings, rolling element bearings. OK, that's the generic word for both roller and ball bearings. Now I'll explain you a few things, what kind of bearings are available in the market. And um, but before we go that, I will actually talk about. I'll actually talk about the history. You know who discovered this concept of bearing in the first for the very first time. So Leonardo da Vinci actually designed, and this is this is these are his designs kept in uh, Musi Museo Galileo in uh, in Italy. So they actually have this uh, these uh, things which he had designed. These are nothing but. These are vertical cone tip thrust bearings. They are still there. They are actually these things are there in which you have a cone and then you have balls for supporting uh, vertical shafts. So this is a roller and ball bearings for one tip vertical axis. And then these are actually pressure resistant ball bearings. So there is a cage and this cage is pressurized. So it's actually a pretty impressive design. If you see uh, back in, uh, I would like to say, I think he was in 1716 something, right? So 17th century, he has designed all these uh, ball bearings. So these these ideas came, ball bearing ideas came uh, in the uh, in Florence in the in the um, Renaissance period. That's when they decided uh, to use these kind of uh, uh, devices, and they and they made these bearings. Off and on, there were concepts of bearing because people were using sleeves. And they were using rotating, so rotating sleeves were there, uh, but then there was a lot more friction. So this idea of putting balls to reduce the friction was uh, and use it as a bearing was first uh, first uh, conceived by Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. So there are various types of bearing. There is ball thrust bearing, which is something like this. If you can see it, there is a ball thrust. So this is a ball with cage. And then there is a. There are two pads for thrust. Right here, so this is a ball thrust bearing right here. A needle bearing is a roller bearing where you have the road. The rollers are very, very thin. That's why you call it needle bearing. They look like needle. So they're very slender, right? The diameter is very small. The length is pretty large. So that's why they are called. Uh, they are called uh, needle bearings. Right? And then uh, if you want to see, uh, so this is this is spherical roller. So I'll show you a spherical roller here. This is a spherical roller. No, no, spherical roller. This is not spherical. They actually spherical roller. This is not spherical roller. It's actually ball bearing. Sorry, I take that back. This is a ball bearing. A spherical roller is actually something like this. It will be something like this, but they, the roller will not be straight. This roller will have a, a shape. It will be sim very similar to this, but this roller will have a have a spherical shape, and these can take reasonably high amount of thrust. Right. So if if you have a bearing, right? Let's decide. I have a bearing like this, right? What kind of loads will appear on bearing? The most generic condition. What kind of loads would appear here? Can somebody tell me? Any ideas? Radial, yes. So radial basically radial means that the load will the road will be in this direction, right? In this direction. Only radial loads will appear. 
So you are saying the load will be there along the radius here, right? Will there be other uh, loads? When I'm when I'm when I'm using this, right? When I'm using this, loads can be in which direction? So if, imagine I have this. I'll take this classic. I'll actually solve a problem for this also. I have this helical gear, right? So this helical gear when it engages, right? There will be some radial forces. Friction shear. Let's not go there. Friction shear and all that. Just talk about directional load directions. Action. Very good. So if if I have this right, this this load, the primary load will be in which direction? On the on the gear, not on not on the bearing. The bearing radial looks right because ra radial will have radial basically means along the radius, right? But on any on any uh, I would say machine element, right? If I have a machine element, right? The machine element in this kind of a machine element, what kind of forces will it see? One it will see would be because it is engaged with another gear here, right? So there will be tangential force, right? There will be an axial force because it is at an angle. So there will be an axial, tangential, and the third one will be radial. So all three components will be there: axial, tangential, and radial. Agreed? So the bearing should be designed to take both radial. So basically, your tangential and radial are nothing but along the radius only. Here it is tangential and radial, but on the bearing, both are sort of radial, right? They're acting in the radial direction. Both tangential and the radial are acting on the tangential direction. So if at this location, if there is an engagement, there will be a tangential and there will be radial. But both tangential and radial will have a effective radial direction, right? Agreed or no? So I'll have a tangential and a radial, but effectively they will still act in the radial direction only. The sum total, the vector will be in the direction of the radius only, right? Yes or no? Okay. Now there will be an axial. So axial, tangential, and radial all three directions will be there. So some some of them can take. Will this be able to take a take, take uh, axial loads? This kind of a bearing. Yes or no? If I have this kind of bearing, will it take axial loads? Why not? No is a very good answer. It's a correct answer. Why will not be take take uh, take uh, axial loads? Why not? Yes. Some taper is required. So either you need a taper, or if you want light thrust loads, you need to put the balls in a groove, in a deep groove, so that it can sustain the axial loads. As it is. This is not designed to sustain an axial load. This is. This is. Right. So I just want to give you some ideas. So there are. So there is the kind of bearings are spherical roller. Ball thrust, needle bearings, plane bearings, roller thrust, tapered roller bearing, self aligning bearings and ball bearings. So these are kind some some kinds of bearings which you would go and see in the market. If you go want to go buy bearings, these will be the types which will be available in the market. Next. So the types of ball bearings. So primarily, if I were to uh, to classify it, there will be two main kinds. First will be ball. The other will be roller. Right. So ball bearing is. You have deep groove ball bearings. Deep groove means they will sit in a groove, and this one can actually take some 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 thrust they can take, not a whole lot, but some thrust they can take. Some thrust it can take. Now this is filling notch. So there is a filling notch here. There is an angular contact bearing, shielded bearing, seated bearing, sealed bearing. So this 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 entire thing is sealed. Uh, there is external self aligning means that if there is some play this can this can take some 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 play there there is double row so if you want uh, so this double row can actually take more thrust than a single row bearing okay and uh, there are self aligning bearings there is thrust bearing which is which can actually uh, which is designed to take thrust
sorry about this and there is self aligning thrust bearings okay so these are the uh, types of ball bearings similarly there will be types of thrust roller bearings there is right cylindrical so these are primarily again for uh, radial loads right so if i am using radial loads so i have two options either i do multiple uh, balls like two balls or uh, like what i showed here what i showed here double rows or i use a wider wider roller right so i can take thrust in a nice way so if i have high amount of radial load right high amount of radial load even in the radial high amount of radial load what would you recommend do you would you recommend uh, 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 basically a ball bearing or a roller bearing what would you recommend if i have very high radial loads which one would you recommend why would you recommend roller load it's a, it's a correct answer but why would you recommend roller why not why not ball okay so what does more contact area does yes so larger area and radial direction what we will do is now because your failure occurs because of pressure right your compressive your contact pressure will basically somehow let the race or the ball yield right so if i have larger area means my pressures will be lower even if my load is higher right so it always makes sense if you have higher loads you go for roller bearings if you have lower loads you go for ball bearings okay and these are types of roller bearings right cylindrical spherical roller bearing so the spherical roller bearings actually is called spherical if you see it is not straight this has a this has a spherical shape so this can take thrust pretty nicely okay this can take thrust pretty nicely and uh, uh, these radial bearings are actually used for this these uh, the roller bearings are used for higher first thing is higher radial loads higher radial loads and but the catch here is it would need much better alignment but much better alignment because ball is very easy to align right but but if you if you have a roller your alignment has to be more precise and the race you know what race is right the race means inner race the inner shield right here and out so inner race is this one and outer race is this one right this is if you want to see this let me just show you this is the inner race this is the outer race for for uh, your race races have to be more stiff more stiff for roller bearings and if you have a tapered roller bearing the way it is designed is it actually all all those taper right all those taper will all the taper will intersect at the axis so your alignment is more precise you have to the way you have to design the taper angles is all these taper angles should basically meet at the axis okay so that's one of the design constraints with with uh, with uh, tapered roller bearings but this taper tapered roller bearings the axis of bearings uh the rollers intersect at the axis the rollers intersect intersect at the axis at the axis like what i have shown so all of them should come and meet at the axis of your on which this bearing is bearing axis so you, it needs some very precise alignment you have to you have to bear in mind but this kind of a configuration can take very high thrust loads it can take very high thrust loads so if you, if you want to see this all these angles will meet at right at the axis of the of the bearing 
all the angles of this this taper. So this angle will all all of these angles will meet right at the axis axis of the bearing, and this can take high thrust, high thrust. Okay. Any questions up till now? If none, let's move to the next thing. So I'll define some terms in bearing. So when you start to buy bearing or look for standards for a bearing, this terminology you will have to use. And this terminologies would be, let me just go ahead and sh show some terminology. The first thing is, what is meant by bearing failure? What do you think? How do you define that a bearing has failed? What would be your idea of uh, bearing failure? What is your idea of bearing failure? Any answers? If somebody says bearing has failed, right? What would you say? But what would be your basis for making that argument that bearing has failed? Is there a basis for that argument? Any answers? Okay, wear or cracks leading to vibrations, friction higher than expected. But that's fine. Friction will be a friction can be higher even if you are not using good lubricant, right? If your grease is not there, friction will be higher. Will you say bedding has failed? Then somebody says uh, wear or cracks leading to vibrations. Okay, uh, wear or crack is the right word. The problem is that you have to define. And the definition says that your wear should be finite. And the actual definition says that your 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 uh, wear or pitting should be of the area of 0 0.01 inch square. If I have this kind of wear, or spalling basically means papri nikal jana. So either I have a thin layer uh, which has been uh, delaminated, or there is a pitting. Or pitting is basically worse than wear. Wear can be very smooth. But pitting is there's a physical there is a physical uh, would uh, for the lack of better word there's a physical cavity right there is a there is a depression on the thing which could be an area of 0.01 inch square that bearing failure in throwing the bearing of course there can be cracks or vibration uh, if cracks is there. Uh, I don't know if you have crack, you would have uh, the bearing would fail very fast because this bearing is under cyclic loading. So crack will, if there is a crack, it will just go ahead and, and propagate and uh, the bearing will catastrophically fail. So catastrophic failure, you would know because the bearing will physically, physically crack. But in a lot of cases, bearing will not physically crack, but still we declare it failure because there is a small pit somewhere. But that's how you define it, right? Now, number of revolutions. So basically now some of the key terms for bearing is there's something called rated life. Or rating life. So what we call it, we call it L10. So the any if you go and look at any catalog, SKF catalog or all those uh, uh, bearing manufacturers catalogs, they will say this is a rating life and they will say rating life as L10. So this L10 basically is the minimum life. So they guarantee that this will be the minimum life of the bearing, which they say that 50% uh, about 10% of the bearings will fail within this time. So if I have 100 bearings, statistically 10 bearings will fail at this life. No more than 10 will fail. Okay, that's L10 uh, life. Uh, and this is for a group of bearings. So basically we say that the life in which 10% of the samples fail, so we do thousands and thousands of studies and if we say that within this life statistically within this time frame 10 percent fail we call it rating life this is the rated life of the bearing the bearing will last much longer than that right but the vendor is guaranteeing that it will at least last this much time that's his guarantee then he defines something called median life or average life of the bearing so for average life of the bearing, right? For the average life of bearing, sorry. 
So every level bearing, they will take many samples. So they'll take various groups of samples. So, so basically each sample will have some size and you will do a whole population of those samples, right? So take like 50, 50 bearings, some 10 samples. Oh, uh, 50 samples each, some 10, 10 different uh, groups. And then what you do is you create an average meet life fund, average or median life. This will, the, the, the life required to fail 50% of the samples would be called average median life. And this is typically about four to five times of the alter. So statistically, your bearing should at least give this much. Your mean life of a bearing should be four to five times of L10 life. L10 life is the most conservative estimate of the bearing. And bearings are supposed to last quite a bit. And the way you determine the life is you, there are there are there are uh, uh, typically number of revolutions is which you number of cycles or revolutions is what uh, is what determines the life, right? Because these evolutions I can get uh, if I go slow. I finish the revolution slower. If I go fast, I eat up those fast. So my bearing ultimately is designed for certain number of cycles. Any ideas what will what what is the minimum cycle typically the bearing manufacturer will advise the minimum. When he talks about minimum minimum uh, life, what do you think would be the minimum life in the mind of the bearing manufacturer? What does he have in mind? Ten to the power nine, a billion, billion cycles. You do run billion cycles. I'm not saying that, but the bearing for a for a for a minimum a billion is slightly more. Yes, so it is right. So a million cycle is the minimum, is the absolute minimum what they expect a thing to run. So when they talk about uh, rated life, right, in cycles, this is what they, the bearing manufacturer will give. One million cycle is their standard. Okay, one million cycle is their standard uh, life. So, but then we need an hours, right? Because we'll be rotating at different speeds. So we need to find out. If I change the speed, so I'll have a I'll have a load speed combination, right? For me, I am interested in at a given load, load which I will say F. So there are three terms which will be there. Load will be there, RPM will be there, right? RPM will be there. Number of, number of rotations or number of revolutions and what else will be there? Hours of operation. Hours of operation. So I need to know if I buy a bearing, I know the rating of that bearing. I know that that rating corresponds to a million cycle. This L, this uh, load which, which they are saying is actually valid for 10 to the power 6 cycle. So these loads are reasonably large, very large loads, they, they say. But I will run it on a on some loading conditions which I have given like some sometimes like I have a shaft. So this shaft will be subjected to the loads which are generated by this uh, this gear. We'll do, exam, we'll do a small problem. So I have finite load and it is rotating at the finite speed. So I should be able to calculate what will be the hours for my application for the given bearing, right? This is what I need to know from this catalog. So all this exercise which I'm doing is given my loading conditions, right? Given, given my RPM, given my loading and given my RPM, what is the life I will get? That's one thing which we will study. The second thing which we will study would be how reliable is it? So there are two things which we are going to discuss today, right, in the class. Any questions up till now? So you understand what is median life, you understand what is L10 life. Then there is something called catalog load rating C10. This is an important concept. The C10 actually says that constant radial load that, that causes 10% of bearings to fail at the bearings rated life. T10 
Typically, by default, the rated the rated life is 10 to the power 6 revolutions of the inner ring. So basically, there are two there are two things. There is C10. C10 is very important. C10 is what they do give that your this is the radial load of the bearing, which will cause 10% of group bearings to fail at the bearing manufacturer's rated life. So C10 is the load. C10 is the design is the uh, is the load by the manufacturer rated load. I would call it rated load. And this life rated rated life LR is 10 to the power six cycle, uh, 10 to the six cycles or 10 to the rotation. So these two things are by default C10 and 10 to the power six. Any questions here? Do you understand what C10 means? C10 means that the bearing designer has envisaged that this is the radial load which will cause 10 percent of the bearings to fail so this is what he has designed for c10 load he has designed for 10 to the power 6 cycles there is another basic load rating c which is a catalog load rating based on 10 to the power 6 cycles of inner inner uh, inner ring the radial load to to cause uh, failure is unrealistically high so this is a reference load, but not an actual load. OK, but for most cases, I will use C10 and I will use LR. These are the bearings thing, uh, bearing manufacturers information, rated, rated load and rated life. OK. So this C10 is also called dynamic load rating, basic dynamic capacity. Now there is something called static load rating. The static load rating corresponds to a permanent deformation where the bearing is loaded to very high loads and the deflection is 0.001 D, which is the D is the diameter of the road. So if you apply load so high that there's a plastic deformation of the rolling element and race. So because what happens is um, under heavy loads, they can deform plastically, right? There's a Hertzian contact. So Hertzian contact is elastic contact, but if I keep the loads very high, there can be permanent plastic deformation. So this static load says that if you put this kind of a load, you will get plastic deformation. This is exceptionally high loads which you can give, right? So you you should never ever go to that uh, that static load rating because if those loads are very very high, even in a static condition, this can uh, this this can cause uh, deformations, right? So you don't want to. That, that's like an upper super upper bound. You cannot ever even go close to those those load ratings. Those are just for your reference. Then there's equivalent road rating, which basically means consistentary load to the bearing, which gives the same life as actual load and rotation conditions. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it more. So basically what happens is there is a load force which is there. There is a life which is there. And then one set is given by the bearing manufacturer and one set is required by the designer. When I am a designer, I am using a bearing. I should know how much this bearing will last for my application. So I'll show you how do you correlate that. So basically, people have created something called load life relationships. Load life relationships. A very interesting concept. What they say is they were done a lot of tests. So under what forces, what life you get? Life meaning how many cycles it lasts. So it basically means if my force is higher, higher force, if I have a higher force, if I have a higher force, the life will be number of cycles it can take will be lower or higher. What will happen to the number of cycles? Lower, very correct, very true. So basically what happens is if my force is higher, number of cycle is much lower. As I reduce the forces, my number of cycles keep on increasing. Num how many rotations I can do? And people have done all these tests and uh, on a log log scale, log F versus log life, log L is actually linear. And the data shows that this is F L this relation is FL over A, FL1 over A. 
is equal to constant. Data fits like this, very nice and sweet. And this A is three for ball bearings, and A is ten over three for roller bearings. For roller bearings, both cylindrical and tapered. Right. Any idea what this means? FLA one by A is equal to constant. Where do I use this? How do I use this thing effectively? I know that under whatever condition the F, which is the radial force which the bearing is supposed to take and the life, which is a number of rotations are related. And this F L raised to one over A is a constant. So if I have higher, very high uh, radial forces, the number of the number of revolutions it will last is lower. If I have lower loads, the number of rotations for any given bearing. This is for a given bearing. So for each bearing, I will have this this A, which will be there in the catalog. Oh, oh sorry, which is which is which is which is actually three for ball bearing, ten to the three for roller bearings. But I have this F and L data from the catalog. The the rated data I have. I have FR. I have LR. So what I can say is, I know from this equation that my F1 L1 raised to one over A is equal to F2 L2 one over A. Okay. So basically, now what I can do is I can use the same con concept and I say this is rated FR, which is rated from the catalog, LR, which is rated from the catalog, is equal to whatever I want to design FD and LD. These are my requirements, design requirements. Right. This is my design for this is my design load. Now I know that units of this L. These units of L's are in revolution, but actually I would need this in because my actual ap application will have some RPM, a different RPM. So what will what I can do is I can say FR is equal to LR. LR is life in hours. NR is rated life. NR and 60 will make will give me what is that uh, what is the rated life, and then design will be design load this is hours number of hours design hours this is the rpm nd is rpm and 60 1 over a and 1 over a so i can simplify it in terms of i can convert the number of uh, revolutions or number of cycles with hours and the rotation speed so number of cycles will be equal to number of hours times RPM into 60, which is just common sense, right? So this is the equation which I am, which, 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 in, which is important for me. This is rated load. This is rated number of hours. This is rated RPM. This is 60. Typically, this number is 10 to the power 6. You don't even have to use this LR catalog rating, uh, life, hours, rating speed. You don't have to worry about because this LR and R60 typically is 10 to the power 6, which is the rated life, L, right, L10. And FD is the desired load. This is based on the designer. This is the number of hours it will run in my condition. This is my rotational RPM and this is 60. So these are my conditions, which as a designer I need for my application. And this FR is actually called C10. C10 is the F rated load from the catalog. And this LR is nothing but typically 10 to the power 6. Right. And my, uh, my bearing is this. Right. So LR will be stated by different, but most catalogs use LR as 10 to the power 6 revolutions, 10 to the power 6 cycles. And C10 is the rated load FR. This is what you use. So let's do a small problem. The scale of bearing actually says 
that it bearing is for 10 to the power 6. So I know that uh, this uh, uh, LR is 10 to the power 6. Right. And uh, if you design desire a life of 5000 hours. So my my design requirement is I need LD to be 5000. Right. RPM ND to be 17 25 RPM. And my rated load. FD. Is 400 pounds. 400 pound force. With a reliability of 90%. Which catalog rate is so 90% by default is this. L10. Right, so you don't have to do anything. What you do is you say my C10. Is equal to FD. Right. So basically, if I say C10 into LR, which is this LR, which is my design um, life or L10, 1 over A is equal to FD, right? And LD, which is LD ND by 60 raised to power 1 over A. Is to power one over a. Now I I know my LD is this, ND is this, FD is this. So I can do a simple calculation. I can find out what what rating I have to use from bearing is. I know my FD is 400, 400, and I do. This will be 10 to the power six. This will be 5000. This is 725. This will be 1725 RPM and this will be 60. And this will be. And this will be 1 over A. 1 over A. 1 over A. If it is a roller bearing, then A is equal to 3. Uh, if, if this is a ball bearing, A is equal to 3. If it's a roller bearing, A is equal to 10 by 3. Any questions here in this in this configuration? Then we'll move on to the next one. Any doubts in how do you how do you select bearings for your applications? Everybody gets the concept of L10, right? C10. So C10 is the force which the which the bearing designer says. So I will go ahead and use a bearing rated bearing. The C10 of 14.3 kilonewton. This is what the vendor will say that this bearing is rated for 14.3 kilonewton. Now what is the load I'm applying on this? The actual load. So I'm, I'm applying the actual load only 400 pound and I'm and I'm buying the bearing of 3200 pound rating. Do you see the difference? The, the bearing rating which I'm selecting for carrying a 400 pound uh, load is 3200. So uh, that's why you have to calculate all this, right? Say my bearing, my bearing, uh, my load, my actual load is say 200, 200 Newton uh, or 200, say 200 pound in this case, 200 pound. Will I select a bearing 400 pound? No, I'll select a much higher rating bearing. Because I don't want it to fail. I in the rated life. So if. If. I apply this kind of a load, if I applied, if I apply 3200 pounds or 14 kilo newtons, then this will fail. Then the 10% of of these bearings will fail within. 1 million cycle. If I do that. Right, so the actual loads which 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 we apply are. Many orders of magnitude lower than the rated bearing. Right, so you don't look at the bearing and say, oh my I have a load of uh, 200 uh, kg. Let me buy 500 kg rated bearing. No, no, no. no. 
what you buy is much much higher than that because the way ratings are defined these ratings are defined in a way which basically means that the load should be much much higher because you're bearing life you would want probably as you said a billion cycles one million cycle is is absolutely lowest in the worst condition it should last at least one million cycles and the designer designs that if you really overload it so your design your if you if you basically overload it by 10 times then it will fail in uh, a million cycles you get me the kind of safety which they have taken in the in the account so that's how you basically choose a bearing this is the idea of choosing a bearing any questions here this is actually with 90 the the, the l10 the l10 has built in the c10 l10 has 90% reliability if it is less or more then you will do something I'll, I'll i'll discuss that i'll discuss that how do you how do you so this entire thing with 90 percent reliability all the analysis is the 90 percent reliability now if the reliability changes i will explain it how do you handle that okay that's the next thing which i will do after this now let me do another problem this is slightly more involved problem which requires some visualization and this is an actual problem which i'll give you it says that I have a 25 horsepower foundry crane. Anybody knows what a foundry crane is? And this foundry crane has a speed reducer which pitch diameter of 8.8. So this is like a foundry crane. So this is the crane is supposed to move along this line. Right. And there are two bearings one here so we have one bearing here let me just do so we'll have one bearing here we'll have one bearing here and i will have one bearing here so i have one bearing here and i will have one bearing here and i have a helical gear here I have a helical gear here. So I have a gear here. I have a helical gear. Let's assume a helical gear like this. I have a helical gear like this. I have a helical gear like this here. Exactly like this. Sorry. Exactly like this. This is a helical gear. This is a helical gear and this is say a bearing like this. And this crane moves but this helical gear is there for speed reduction here so what is happening is this gear this gear has a has a diameter of if i were to make this properly this gear this is the axis of that gear so along this axis along this axis i have a i have a gear i have a gear i have a gear which is something like this something like that. I have a gear mounted here. Now this gear is engaged with something else here. So this diameter is 4.04 inch. Oh, this radius is 4.04 inch. Diameter is 8.0, the pit circle diameter. And here there is another thing that is engaging. Here there is another thing that is. So this is the thickness probably. This is the thickness. And there is another thing which will engage here. So there would be there would be forces. Let me make it bigger. So this, so this is say this is how it is. And there is a helical teeth here. And this is engaging here. So when it is engaging, there is a tangential load. There is a load on the tangent. Ten, there is an axial load, which is this load. This is this load is axial load. This load. This load is axial load, which is 344 pounds right along the axis where this thing is mounted there is a tangential load which is 250 oh no sorry this 250 is a radial load which is in the straight direction and then there is a tangential thing then there is a tangential thing tangential thing meaning something like this if i if i have this if i have this so there will be one load like this in the tangent direction 
one load like this radial tangential and then axial okay so this is 595 is tangential this is tangential 595 this is radial which is straight straight like this this is radial and this is the action so what is the net radial load acting here can somebody tell me in this configuration what will be the net load which is acting in the radial direction Any ideas? Any answers? None? Somebody? What is the net radial load acting on this? Nobody. OK, I'll leave it here. Can somebody tell me? So if I know, so let me go back to the question. The question says that I have. 25, sorry. I have 25 horsepower to drive this. This motor which I am using for driving this is a 25 horsepower motor. 25 HP motor. And because of this, what is the torque acting here? How much is the torque acting here? Because of this stuff. How much is the torque acting here? If I again draw this. Imagine that this is or this is perpendicular to the this this face is perpendicular to the axis. Right. How much is torque acting here? What is the torque? So which force will create the torque, the tangential force, right? Which one will create the torque for this? Which one? The tangential one, very good, right? So 595 will create the torque here, right? This one, this 595 will create the torque. So basically I can say, the tangential force acting here times the radius, which is 4.04 inches. Tangential, for, tangential force is 595 pounds. Pounds. This is the torque. This is my torque. Now I have a 25 HP thing, right? I don't know if you know the conversions, but the conversions are. I'll just write the conversion for you. I'll write the conversion for you. The conversion is in horsepower. If I have 63,025 times horsepower is equal to torque into RPM, which is H is equal to if I have if I know the RPM and if I know the torque torque in torque in pound inch pounds pound inch LBF inch. This is this is the relationship. You can do the math if you want, but I'll give you this relationship. So now if I have 63,025 times 25, torque is nothing but 595 into 4.04. I should be able to get RPM. At what RPM this shaft has to rotate? Agreed? I'll just show you the results so that you know. So basically, 
This is the formula. Sorry about this. I don't know why this is not going. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So this is the thing. The relationship is if you know what is the torque in in inches in pound inches. This is the formula 6375 H divided by. So you will get 65, 65.4 revolutions per minute. That should be the rotation of the shaft. Now I have to design two bearings here. The question says, if you go ahead and look at the question, the question asks you that you have to select the bearing reactions that C and D are given. Uh, the C and D are given here, right? In the in the problem, if you see, the bearing reactions are given. Here it is given and here also it is given. Bearing reactions are given here. So bearing reactions are the axial is 344, 356, 297, and you have to design only for, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, th these uh, thrust here. So what, what it says is you have to design only for, because thrust will be taken care of by, by this uh, thing here. So you have to design only for roll here, uh, uh, one roller and one ball. So you have to have um, roller bearing at D and ball bearing at C. A roller bear so this is ball bearing here ball bearing here and roller bearing here roller bearing here roller bearing here right so you have designed now you know you know the rpm rpm you have decided that uh, from the calculations you have gotten n as i think it was 655 if i'm not wrong 655 so now you have found out that your rpm is rpm is 655 Right. 655. So you have to decide. So your RPM is there. What what will be the load ratings which I will use here? So I have to find C10 for C, which is ball bearing, C10 for C and C10 for D. This, this is what I have to find. And the way to find would, would be that I know that uh, this is 10 to the power 6 divided by 1 over A. And this term would be LD, right? And this has to be designed. Look at the problem. It has to be designed for 10, 10 uh, kilo hours, 10,000 hours. So I know my, I know that my load, my life is 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours. I know my RPM, which is 655, right? So I know my LD is 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours. My ND is 655. I have to find out what will be my FD here. What is FD? Can somebody tell me? For, for, for C first. What is the FD for C? What will be the FD at C? Design load at C, FD at C, and then FD at C, and then FD at D. What is FD at C? This is the radial. What will be the radial load here at C? Can somebody help me with this? Any answers here? What will be the radial load at C? I have X and Y components are given. Actually, not X and Y components. The radial, because X is the axis. So you need Y and Z. You need Y, 297 and 356 here. Because that will, X is the axis. So it has to be Y and Z, which will give you the total radial load. So F, FC at D would not be nothing, but it will be 297, 297.5 whole square plus 356.6 whole square and same thing if I go and see so this is 
this is fd at c and same thing fd at d will be equal to will be equal to under root of 297 and 1 297 square 297.5 square plus 16.6 square agreed right i go ahead and calculate these things so i showed you this is what uh, the ratio is ld 60 into 10000 into 65.4 divided by 10 to the power 6 so this will be 393 this 460 at at this will be uh, at d will be 316 and at c it is 356 and 297 if you go ahead and see 356 and 297 and at d 297 106 so these are be the two numbers which you will get you will get 316 at d and at c you get 464.4 so you can find out the ratings right now the ratings c10 ratings would be 3402 and 897 depending upon what you, so this is a roller bearing at d and at c you are using a ball bearing so 3402 rating and 18970 your rating and what is your actual actual force if you look at it actual forces are these 316 and 464 right you are getting some minimum if you would say right uh, at uh, uh, at d what is the load at d the load is 316 so here actual load is 316 and here the actual load is 464 and the design loads which you are choosing is 3400 to and 1897 so you get me so this is when you choose the bearing right you first find out what my load is what my rpm is and then do this and go and search in the catalog oh i want the design c10 loads of 5 times 10 times more than what i am actually using it for you get me so this is the concept of selecting a bearing from a catalog you have to do you have to identify couple of things you have to identify what loads are actually acting in your mechanism a what rpm it will move and then go ahead and do the simple uh, relationship right simple log log relationship for that and then find out your load ratings any questions here if there are any questions let's discuss it and then i'll move on to something uh, i'll i'll briefly touch upon this yeah why are we calling the equivalent of radial and initial at net radial is it, it it doesn't act in the radial direction at the point of application so tell me if let me just just do this i have this load right one load is acting like this other load is acting like this and one acting like this so let's say the this is axial right this is axial along the axis this is this is again my x so the, so let's say this is my x this is my y and this is my z where are y and z acting are the y and z acting in the radial direction or in the axial direction sir they are acting in the plane not exactly in the radial direction but the plane of the so imagine imagine my x is also radial y is also radial right and any angle is also radial what do you mean by radial if if you if you want to understand this right any anything that is acting towards the center would be radial right or no yeah yeah correct so so because you think in cartesian right you think in cartesian so when you when you calculate you will calculate in cartesian geometry right you will calculate fx loads fy loads fz loads mx my and mz that's how you solve your uh, your uh, force balance right your force and moment balance but actually the bearing sees the loads in x and y both in the radial direction so it will have an effective radial direction which will be equal to fx square so the net load will be in some some angle which is f square fx square plus fy square and you know fy by fx will be tan theta so actual load will be acting still in the radial direction which will, the magnitude will be root over fx square plus fy square agree uh sir what if the bearing doesn't take any kind of tangential load like it doesn't have a ability to take tangential load and then there is no, what, three what components of the when you, when you talk about tangential loads right the bearing the bearing is bearing is not a, 
so you have to understand that the bearing is not a gear. Right bearing. What does bearing do? Bearing will take a load, right? The shaft will give the load to the bearing. Where, the, where will the bearing load come from? Yes, OK, the shaft, shaft will give. Right? The shaft will give X and Y loads. It's not like a gear. You are, you are, you are confusing. The shaft will transfer two FX, FX and FYs and F axials to this. And this will finally be transferred onto the housing and then to the structure. Finally, finally, wherever you bolt it. We'll see the reactionary loads. Right? Yes. OK. Yeah. So let's go ahead and now do what you are asking about reliability versus life. So what if I want to understand what reliability is? Uh, I don't have much time, but what I will do is give you some concepts and then we'll solve a problem in the next class. OK, and then we'll uh, in the next class, we'll also look at how do you look at the catalog, right? That also we'll discuss. So basically the concept is that this uh, when you measure the the life at constant load, right? When you at constant load, you will see at different RPMs. You do the, the test and then see the distribution which is there, right? The level distribution is skewed. Now, if I have a skewed distribution, what kind of function should we what? What kind of distribution should we use? Any ideas? If it is nice, we will use Gaussian, right? For a skewed distribution. What what probably is what PDF should we use? Any ideas? Just guesses. No guesses. So I'll tell you. So if it is skewed, typically people use log. Shift the mean is fine, but typically what happens is you need a distribution which captures the skewness. So typically people use either log normal distribution or what they use is they use something called Weeble distribution. So most of the reliability studies, people use Weeble distribution. That's something which is very in reliability engineering. People use Weeble distribution quite a bit. I'll tell you what Weeble distribution is. Weeble distribution is. Weeble distribution is something like this. Which is something like this. This is the distribution function. So at x is less than x0, fx is equal to 0. At x is greater than x0. Uh, so if it is. Um, uh, so x is greater than x0, it, it's 0. And on the other side, from 0 to x0 to x. If x varies between if, uh, if x, uh, actually this should be, this should be x0 and x, I think. This should be x0 and this should be x. I mistake. Okay. Okay. So this will be this distribution. And anything greater than x, anything less than x0, uh, x, uh, X is less than X zero. Oh, I think this is fine. This is fine. My my mistake. So if if uh, X is less than X zero, if X is less than X zero, it is zero. If X is greater than X zero, then this is the distribution. Sorry, sorry, it is it is correct. I, I take that back. I take that back. Okay. So this is how the distribution function works. So it the function actually starts. This is zero, and then it will start something like this. That's how it starts. And this B actually governs what kind of slope it will take. What kind of nature of the curve will be is actually governed by B. OK, so this is the nature of the curve. You can look at uh, Weeble distribution. This is the function which we use for. For modeling reliability. Called X. X is nothing but L by L10. L is the life. For different reliabilities, so 50% reliability there will be different L. For for 30% reliability there will be different L, and that for 10% reliability for L10, what will be the value of X? Anybody? For L10, what will be the value of X? Yes. Right. 
So basically, what we do is we say that reliability is a function of x, which is defined at L by L naught. X naught is the minimum value of the variate. So if you see, the minimum value of variate basically means that it is greater than x naught. X naught if it is less than if x is less uh, if x is less than x naught it is zero, right? So this is the x naught is the minimum val value of the variate. This is this is what x naught means. Theta is the parameter corresponding to the sixty three point two one percent sixty three percent, which should be that's what. Theta is defined as that 63 percentile, and B is the shape that controls the skewness. So these are the parameters, and this is reliability. So reliability can be discussed based on the probability distribution function of Weibull. You could describe this will be the reliability. So I'll stop here. We'll talk more about reliability in the next class. Okay. Any questions you guys have about the projects or anything? We'll be happy to talk about it a little bit. Or have a great day. I think uh, you guys are free to leave now. <laughs>